Hello, and welcome to this episode of Below the Surface. I'm your host, Stephanie Cavigliano, and here comes my co-host, Darshna Kamani. Thank you, Stephanie, and hello, everyone. I hope you're all well. Ready for the week, Stephanie? Ready as I'll ever be, Darshna, but I have some good news for you today. Today is actually National Creme Brulee Day. Oh, creme brulee. I'm not sure how I feel about creme brulee. One of your favorites? No, it's not. I I fancy myself a bit of a dessert connoisseur, and I could kind of take or leave creme brulee, but any excuse to indulge is fine by me. Oh, I'm with you on the indulgence for sure. What would you pick if you could pick a sweet treat? It'd have to be something with chocolate, 100%. It could be a chocolate cake, um, oh, anything, yeah, anything. Maybe a chocolate cake with vanilla ice cream. Oh, yes, warmed up chocolate cake with vanilla ice cream. Classic combo, classic combo. How about you? Uh, Same, I have an ice cream problem. A bit of a cookie, (laughs) also. (laughs) Yes, cookie dough, your thing? Any, in, in any form, I don't discriminate. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. So dessert it is for this week. I mean, we can make this the whole hour if you want. Uh, I don't know I'm how the you. audience feels, but we would like to have- And we have some good guests too. Maybe they have some <laughs> dessert options they like. Yeah, you know, if you're, if you're viewing now, weigh in, let us know how you feel about creme brulee and if there's a better alternative in your opinion. I'm curious. Maybe that's our, the topic of our next uh, trend report. I think so. Dessert and spearfishing, I'm sure they go together. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> well, if you all joined us last week, you'll remember that we spoke to Fleming Shi, who is our CTO at Barracuda, and we talked about the future of SD-WAN. And of course, we had to mention Barracuda's new Cloud Gen WAN, which is the first secure global SD-WAN service built natively and available on Microsoft Azure. So a super interesting conversation last week with Fleming. If you missed it, you can always check it out on demand. Head over to our LinkedIn page um, and you can find a YouTube link. So we do have a great show for you all lined up today. A topic very close to my heart that is separate from dessert. Another topic close to my heart. So before we bring on our guests, a very quick reminder that you can ask us questions by typing them into the comments section below or feel free to just say hello and let us know where you're watching from. Indeed, Stephanie, we really do have a great lineup for you today and a very relevant topic. Last week, Barracuda released key findings about the way cyber criminals are attacking and exploiting email accounts. The report reveals a specialized economy emerging around email account takeover and takes an in-depth look at the threats organizations face and the types of defense strategies you need to have in place. I'm intrigued. It's crazy to think that attackers are creating this whole economy around email attacks. So let's find out some more and really delve into into the report. Now I'd like to welcome our guest today, Asaf Sidon, Associate Professor at the University of Columbia and Valued Advisor to Barracuda, as well as Neil Shaw, a Software Engineering Specialist. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. Thank you for having us on. Glad to be here. It's great to have you guys. So before we start, favorite desserts or creme brulee? Probably a snickerdoodle ice cream with vanilla. I mean, sorry, a snickerdoodle cookie with vanilla ice cream warmed up. Very nice. I'm not a dessert person, to be honest. I think it's a waste of time. Just you know, get me a bigger <laughs> steak or something. <laughs> no way. I would skip everything for dessert. I'm the same. I never understood <laughs> it. Okay. Me either. More dessert from, for us. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We'll have yours, Asaf, any day. No problem. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for joining us today. We have so much to cover, so I'm going to jump straight in. Um, email attacks is such a hot topic. In fact, account compromise incidents and business email compromise are continuously in the news. Have there been any stories lately that have really alarmed you? I think two weeks ago we saw the the Twitter hack, and that was yeah. a pretty pretty surprising attack, given that it was executed by four people who barely knew each other, and uh, one of the one of the one of the people actually got into the Slack account, the internal accounts for Twitter, and was able to see some credentials being transferred between employees, and that's how they actually got in. So I, I thought that was pretty interesting, given that credentials are being shared and 
and certain employees are even given access to kind of this internal server that's able to reset passwords for accounts and disable two-factor two -factor auth. So it kind of illustrates the idea and security of least privilege and separation of responsibility, I think. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think that Twitter um, compromise is kind of something that kind of everybody in the security world has been uh, focused on uh, more or less. So, um, and then I think another one that's a little bit more email related. Um, so we saw um, the these uh, attempted um, uh, email attacks against the um, uh, British uh, Premier League uh, football. Um, so I think that, you know, so for those who are not familiar with that, um, the attackers were able to impersonate uh, one of the parties in a, a transfer of a, of a player between uh, two different teams. Um, and so th this, this is a pattern of attacks we've been seeing actually for a very long time. Um, in other um, domains we've been seeing, for example, attackers uh, take over real estate, uh, various firms that are involved in real estate transactions, and then kind of uh, direct the uh, um, the wire, wire transfer to a different bank account. And so it was... Uh, Kind of interesting to see that they're also going after you know uh, uh, the kind of uh, top tier sports uh, you know organizations, but you know that, that doesn't surprise surprise me. But but it seems like they're you know they're they're not not shy, and the attackers are quite audacious in terms of their targets. Right, just goes to show you even large organizations are you know not exempt from being the victim of these types of attacks. And I think a good reminder for all of us: don't share login credentials over chat channels <laughs> you find yourself typing your password in to share to somebody else just stop yep that's a good i think we can end the show now yeah that's, a good idea. <laughs> that's it <laughs> words of wisdom um yeah so you know it's very clear that these attacks can be so devastating i think those real estate examples really pull it pull it all, all of our heartstrings people losing their down payments and just massive amounts of money um so I think it, it kind of goes without saying, but I want to hear it from you guys, the pros. Why is email such an attractive threat vector? So, yeah, so I mean, there's, there's, there are various stats um, out there on, um, you know, 90% of cyber attacks start with email. Um, and even in, in, uh, in our report, um, you know, I th initially this report started out actually uh, the goal of it was to, to kind of characterize account takeover generally, not just email focused, but it was interesting that um, Neil found that um, actually, even though, um, so specifically this report was done on Office 365 accounts, and even though Office 365 accounts contain a lot of different enterprise applications, you know, from uh, Microsoft Teams, uh, you know, Skype for Business, OneDrive, SharePoint, et cetera, still um, about 80% 80, 80 of the attacks only involved email. Um, so that, that kind of reinforces um, that email is such an important, you know, target. And, and I think the reason for that is um, because it's kind of still a place where um, you can communicate, you basically can send an email to anybody in the world and authentication is quite weak, right? Um, you don't, you know, you can create anybody, you know, I can just go ahead and create a Gmail account or an Outlook account and send an email to basically anybody in the world. And, you know, by and large, that email has a decent chance of actually getting, you know, arriving to that person. And so that just opens up, um, you know, a lot of possibilities for, for attackers to, to try and target this, this system. Yep. And going off of uh, kind of what Asaf was saying, um, with these cloud applications, there needs to be some level of general level of sophistication needed to kind of access these, these applications and actually be able to know kind of maneuver like where the data is located, for example. While in an email, everything is very well contained because then you have access to the context lists, you have access to the inbox, you can even set up an email outside and have, for example, emails being forwarded. That's something that we've actually seen um, in some of our work and even previous work, uh, prior work. So it's, it basically gives an attacker kind of a lev being able to kind of access information in one collective place um, versus having data scattered around in other applications. And I mean, email is definitely such an important part of everyone's life for business and personal. So um, you can see why it's so attractive to attackers. So you've mentioned the report. Um, let's delve in a bit more into the detail. Um, Asaf and Neil, you and your teams collaborated to study the end-to-end -end life cycle of a compromised account. You examined, I believe, 159 compromised accounts that spanned 
111 organizations. You looked at how an account takeover can happen, how long attackers have access to the compromised account, and how attackers use the information from these accounts. So that's a high level of what the report goes into. Can you tell us what some of the key findings are that you guys found interesting from the research? Sure. So, um, and I'll, of course, let Neil chime in as well. I, for, for me, the um, kind of maybe the most interesting takeaway, and, and this is something we've suspected for a long time, but we've never had real hard evidence for, um, is the amount of time that these campaigns, I, I dare say even wouldn't call them attacks, they'd call them campaigns. So, so the amount of time um, that these campaigns uh, take um, is it can be you know truly high. Uh, so in the uh, report, we and so so I just wanted to give a little bit of context. Actually, th these attacks are, are quite difficult to characterize because the attacker is kind of you know stealing the credentials of um, of an employee, but it actually coexists with that employee in the same account. So it's very hard to actually tell you know which actions taken on this email account were taken by the legitimate users in which were taken by the attacker. And this is also why these attacks are so confounding to, you know, IT and security teams, because they don't necessarily know whether the account is, a particular account is compromised at a given time. Um, so, so, you know, a lot of the work here was to kind of painstakingly go through the data and actually determine, you know, when did the attack start, when did it end, or at least our best guess to when it ended. And it turns out that, yes, in some of these uh, campaigns, the attackers, um, you know, once they get initial access to the account, they sit in for, you know, weeks and even months at end on a particular um, enterprise account, um, kind of biding their time, infiltrating multiple accounts with you know, multiple users within that organization, and then, you know, uh, collecting reconnaissance and, and launching additional attacks. So, um, the um, sad truth is that for you know a lot a lot of IT and security teams, this isn't isn't a, you know a type of attack where you just stop you know one employee got infected and you're done. It's very likely that you know that uh, either you know that attack has spread throughout the organization and, and may reside for for weeks and months on end. And so I think you know people need to be really aware of that. It's kind of like an infection, not to uh, you know pull us too much into COVID nineteen. Uh, uh, examples here, but but it's it's similar, right? Uh, once once an infection takes takes root in a kind of closed environment, it, it's very hard to to uh, to kind of uh, deal with. Yeah. and I think as as we were kind of going through our findings, and and for example, this was one of our one of the biggest ones that Asaf mentioned. Um, we also kind of saw the importance of kind of having a detector, right? If you have like a non real time detector that flags after the initial compromise, the importance of having continuous monitoring of attacker activity. Because as Asaf was mentioning, attackers are active in these accounts for long periods of time. So having a detector that can continuously monitor over a longer time horizon can prevent significant damage is something that we saw. And I think uh, one more thing that I, I thought that was interesting um, was that we actually had access to kind of a third party data breach alert provider. And we saw that 20% of the accounts were actually compromised via an online password data breach. So I thought that was interesting because you have like the potential problem of password reuse, right, be between personal and email accounts. And these the accounts that are being compromised via this, this data breach wouldn't be detected immediately, right? So having kind of a, a detector that's able to flag over continuous amounts of time is really useful, I think, for, for, for this purpose especially. That's a great point. If they have, if the hackers have your actual credentials, what's to stop them from using them to log into your account? That's kind of scary. Yeah. You know, I, I have to just say, I was talking to my mom yesterday and she said, I just got an email from a bank I don't bank with <laughs> asking me to reset my password. And I said, mom, don't click the link. Right? That's a spear phishing attack. It's just, uh, it's rampant and it can, and it can affect anybody from personal accounts to business accounts. Um, so some really interesting findings and especially interesting that attackers who compromise an account, they access the account and they may not act for days or even weeks at a time. They may just wait until the perfect time. Is that right, guys? Yeah, so that's what makes it challenging, right, to, to detect attack activity is you might have an attacker that's been in an account for long periods of time and you don't see much kind of suspicious activity until 
a certain point in time. So, I mean, when you think about it, right, um, the amount of money an attacker can extract from a you know from a successful campaign like this is you know easily in the tens of thousands, you know, up you know up to millions of dollars. So they're willing to wait, right? Um, you know, so they're willing to be strategic about it. Um, yeah, and even, as we mentioned in the be you know, beginning of the conversation, right? You know, this this could even affect individuals. You don't even have to go to enterprises. So when you do go to enterprises, obviously, you know, there's so many touch points, so many people that are involved with various business dealings, transactions that you know, just a very strategic kind of touch point. Like there's a particular payment going out to a vendor, at right? The you know, right, right, the right. If you send the right email at the right time you can extract a lot of uh, you know a lot of money out of the organization so so attackers know that and and they're willing to be patient and that's what that graph was showing us it was showing us the the likelihood or, or frequency of attacks based on the day of the week yeah and, and that's you know that's another kind of interesting thing right the the attackers understand kind of so they kind of understand marketing 101 right <laughs> i don't know uh, how many of the audience uh, are familiar with this stuff, right? But like, if you ever talk to like marketing people or salespeople, they'll always tell you, "Oh, you don't, you never sell a, you never send a sales email on a Sunday, right?" I think, although some people, I think maybe there's some kind of people that would say because nobody else is sending it, I'll send it. But but in any case, you know, I think attackers are really following kind of best practices almost of like email sales and marketing, right? So so yeah, they'll, you know, like um, when when we looked at like time of day, day of the week that these attacks occur we really couldn't that that is kind of a worthless signal to be honest because attackers understand you know for example if they're attacking a particular organization that's based in a location they'll just time their you know the, the emails they send um based on the work working work hours they're, they're not stupid right so those kind of very obvious things are you know they won't fall into those very obvious traps so in this report, you also highlighted the new specialized economy that's emerging around these types of attacks. So how does that work and why do you think that that's developing? Yeah, so we actually set out to, once we kind of had an idea of how long attackers are active in these compromised accounts, uh, we set out to try to see what are the different attacker usage patterns that exist within these accounts. So we actually found kind of two segments for these accounts. So we saw that around 50% of the accounts, attackers, there is a single attacker that seemed to be compromising these accounts. So we saw small durations of attacker activity and, and small time gaps between these attackers. So attacker probably compromised and uses the account, the same attacker for, for a short period of time. And another kind of on the, on the opposite side of the spectrum, we saw that we had kind of some inclination that maybe there were Kind of multiple attackers in some of these accounts so we kind of tried to understand like why are we seeing these large time gaps between attacker activities so we would see large time windows between when an attacker first acts in the account and then when they continue to act so we kind of wanted to understand like okay is there is there some is there some way that there's actually a multiple attackers at play where one one attacker compromises the account while another kind of extracts value and uses the account so we actually saw that in, in, in quite a, a fair amount of accounts, 31% of the accounts um, suggested signs of multiple attackers. So we kind of saw that by this, by this finding that attackers are likely starting to specialize in their roles. So you have attackers that are kind of developing a skill set to compromise accounts, while attackers are developing a skill set to use the accounts, right? So likely the, the, the ones that are compromising the accounts are then taking those accounts turning it around and selling them or transfer credentials to other attackers. So it's a good way for them to, it's, it's a, a way for them to make money um, based on selling these credentials. And then these other attackers that actually use the accounts, they're able to extract more value from them and, and uh, maybe perform more lateral phishing attacks or any, any, any type of other attack they want, they want to perform. And that's not new, right? So having, um, attackers with different skill sets. You've got, you mentioned specialized attackers and those that have more general skill sets. That's um, probably not new, but seeing them work together, is that something that's a new trend or is that something that we've seen in the past as well? We've seen this in the past as well. I mean, so um, there, there, there have been study, kind of um, interesting studies, um, you know, decade or two back um, done, for example, on the spam economy. 
um, that has showed, you know, that, um, you know, if, if you remember the old days of spam where you get, uh, you know, advertising for kind of various pills uh, that you can use and stuff like that, right? So um, it was shown that, yeah, the, the different actors, the, you know, there's the, the, the attackers that create the botnets to send the spam, and then there's the attackers that actually, and they kind of sell their infrastructure to the content attackers that create the crafting emails. Um, and so we're seeing, seeing a very similar thing here. I mean, so, so I guess it's not, it's not unexpected. It's just interesting because this is a relatively new type of uh, threat, you know, that has it's existed for maybe a couple of years um, and, it, and it's on the rise. So it's just interesting to kind of see this economy emerge um, um, even within, you know, email account takeover. Yeah, and it's, it's something that, that, as Asaf was mentioning, we kind of had an inclination at the beginning of our study is like something that is probably definitely happening. So it was just kind of cool to see the, that we would, we would actually be able to like ha see like findings that would kind of confirm what we, what we believed in the beginning with the possible transfer of credentials and this long time gaps. So you guys hinted at this earlier, you know, the payoff for these cyber criminals can be massive, so it's well worth their time. Um, can you tell us a little bit more how they're using these accounts once they do get it? Yeah, so there, there's many ways that we've seen in, in attackers kind of use these accounts. So kind of one common way is they infiltrate one account. And because this is, especially in an enterprise setting, right, when they, when they can compromise an employee account, they could potentially launch additional attacks against other users, right? Using this trusted identity. So they've compromised a legitimate employee account and they can launch additional attacks. Um, other ways, right? Like we've seen, there's a lot of sensitive enterprise emails within these accounts, as well as sensitive data, right? So for example, just simply like if people are going back to the Twitter hack, right? If people are transferring credentials across emails, which hopefully they, they aren't, but if that's going on, then it's a way for attackers to kind of leverage and, and get into more accounts and credentials, right? So those are kind of two common ways that I think are, are leveraged by attackers. Um, I don't know if, if Asaf has any other to add. Yeah, no, I think uh, that reconnaissance and then, you know, actually using the email account to launch, you know, other attacks, those are very common. So. I know you mentioned obviously Twitter and you know sharing of of account details. Um, so what what are the other ways that attackers are getting in? And then Stephanie briefly mentioned that you know they're staying in the accounts for a long time. You know how long are they staying in? And you know why do they wait? Yeah. So I think the the kind of the common ways that attackers are getting into accounts is through phishing, right? So we, we all experience kind of those, as, as you guys were mentioning, kind of those spammy type of emails where they ask you to kind of enter your credentials. So that, that's the most common way. Um, but we've also seen, right, with as we mentioned, with kind of the data breaches that we saw where accounts and passwords were being leaked and, and shared between personal email accounts. So I think those are the two kind of common ways that we've seen attackers to get into accounts. And with respect to like why they wait, I think the primary reason is, I mean, one, one reason why that attackers wait could possibly be like that they're trying to kind of evade a detection. So if, they, if they're acting very continuously, like some attackers, they do act very continuously. Their, their goal is to quickly act in an account and then kind of stop using the account. But attackers who wait and kind of blend in with the regular traffic, and that's and something else that we saw is, is that attackers do tend to blend in with traffic. So they use kind of proxy services, and kind of ways to blend in with IP addresses, for example. So that's one way where attackers are starting to kind of get more sophisticated in terms of evading detection. And, and it's something that we've, we've, we've seen in previous work. And uh, that, that's, that's one reason why they can spend long times in, in accounts. Yeah, we, and we've seen um, on the more sophisticated um, side of things, um, there's, um, there's a type of attack we call um, conversation hijacking <clears throat> where the attacker, you know, so again, if, if you have, imagine you have some type of actual like impending, for example, financial transaction that's like, about to take place in the organization. Um, 
So the attackers actually will use the um, compromise account just for reconnaissance. So they'll just observe, kind of wait, and then see this, obviously trying to observe accounts, uh, email users that you know are likely to engage in such a transaction. And then once that transaction is about to take place, perhaps they will then send actually an email, not necessarily even from the compromise account, maybe from a third party or impersonating a third party, like a vendor, for example, that the company needs to pay, um, and then kind of inject themselves into an existing actually conversation, let's say kind of into a reply to chain uh, without the person in the, in the infected organization noticing um, and kind of uh, and, and asking, for example, that the money be sent elsewhere. Um, so, you know, the reconnaissance gives you a lot, right? Like, cause it gives you the, all this context. Um, and then, you know, even with just in, in the right context, if like, there's an impending transaction and there's a sense of urgency and the person that's doing it needs to, you know, get it done, let's say by a certain deadline, right? Um, that's kind of a perfect storm for these attackers to just inject themselves um, and, and, you know, and, and with just a single email, kind of get, get like a bunch of money wired somewhere that they need to. So, so a lot, a lot of, I, you know, I, I think a lot of the work that they do is reconnaissance on, on these accounts. Uh, can you guys help us just kind of quickly understand how how exactly the hackers are covering their tracks? You sort of hinted at it a little bit, um, but what techniques are they using to make sure that they go undetected? Yeah, so I think uh, as the soft was mentioning in in previous work, they we, we they actually found that attackers are primarily accessing accounts and, and sending emails during normal business hours, right? and during times that are kind of working hours. So that's one way that they've see, we've seen that they've tried to evade detection, right? During using these accounts at kind of normal hours that are expected by the user. Um, another thing we've seen is that attackers have uh, tried to kind of blend in with the traffic. So kind of in a, a good proportion of our accounts, uh, we saw that actually attackers are using kind of proxies and IP addresses from the same kind of locations as the true user. Um, so trying to blend in, trying to evade kind of detection schemes that kind of operate on on more anomaly detection techniques. Um, so how suspicious is this location? Well, if they're coming from a location that's very similar to kind of the true user of the account, then it's gonna be hard to hard to kind of kind of track down the attacker there. Um, so th those are kind of two two main things that we've seen. Yeah, are there are there um other steps attackers take um, to hide their presence is they will actually proactively delete um, emails that might indicate that they're in the account. So for example, if they send an email um, from the infected account, they might delete the reply to that email or they might delete that email that they sent from the sent items folder. Um, and then um, another thing they might do is like if the email system, for example, generated a security alert, hey, you know, there's a new login from, you know, from the new location, you know, th those types of email they'll also obviously want to delete because they don't want the user to be alerted to their presence. Um, other other steps, interesting things they do. We do see them sometimes mess around with um, what are called the inbox forwarding rules. Um, so I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with that, but um, you know, like for example, in Outlook, you can set these uh, special rules that say like if a particular email comes from a particular place, send them this, you know, here or there. So they might send set up a rule either to hide their their tracks or to exfiltrate data outside of the account. Um, so yeah, they, they're they're pro, you know very proactive in terms of trying to make sure that their access. At the end of the day, they they want to preserve access to this account, and they don't you know so uh, it's an asset for them, right? So um, yeah, they, they're they're quite proactive in that. So I mean, to me, they seem to the attackers definitely seem to be obviously trying to avoid detection, doing everything they can to stay in the accounts. Um, so what kind of detection can organizations use to catch these kinds of compromises? Sure, I can see. Yeah, so um, there are kind of uh, a few steps um, that are important. So um, still, you know, we, we uh, at least based on our data, I mean, a, a lot of the attacks still initiate from a phishing email, right? So the, the way that attack, the, still the majority of um, ways, the, the, the majority of cases 
attackers infiltrate, kind of do the in initial infiltration via a phishing email that is trying to fish for credentials, for example. So obviously having a system that can intelligently um, detect these kind of targeted phishing emails is obviously uh, really important. Mm -hmm. um, then, you know, even after, so let's say, um, you know, attackers, no, you know, no email security, no security system is 100% perfect. So assuming that you, you know, someone in the organization did get compromised, you want to also have, this is kind of what Neil was talking about, post-infiltration um, post uh, detection, right? So you want to be able to have systems that look at IP logins, for example, um, to see if there are any anomalies that look at these for email forwarding rules to see if there are any weird changes. And then to also, very importantly, monitor internal traffic um, because a lot of traditional email systems um, don't look at any emails emanating from within the organization or from between employees. Now, obviously, in this case, th that traffic is crucial. Um, and then finally, you need to have tools to kind of, what we call kind of conduct forensics or invest, you know, post um, to, 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 so let's say you confirmed a particular employee was infected, you wanna be able to remediate that. So you wanna see, wanna lock out, off access to that account, of course, but then you also need to track all the emails that they may have sent um, you want to automatically delete those, and then you want to follow up with those employees as well and see um, and kind of monitor them as well. So, so you kind of have to have um, systems that look at all kind of the various steps along the path and uh, both the initial infection, but also kind of continuously monitor um, the accounts for, for infection, looking across a variety of signals. Uh, finally, I'll, I'll just mention kind of two other kind of technologies that are, are really important in this, right? So. Um, one is uh, training, which is something, you know, it's, uh, more on the human aspect, but, um, you know, a lot more and more organizations are setting up security awareness training uh, programs, but you really want to focus on these scenarios, on account takeover, what happens if, you know, when you are simulating these campaigns, simulate a campaign from an internal employee, um, simulate a campaign that, you know, is very contextual, you know, that like, but you're, you're kind of almost act as a red team, uh, right. So imagine what an attacker would do and kind of try to simulate a campaign and, and really make sure employees are aware of that. And then the other technology um, that's kind of um, a really important one is, is a multi-factor authentication and, and just strong password controls. I mean, so all, all of these attacks, you know, multi-factor authentication doesn't stop everything. Um, and you know, we've definitely seen examples of attackers you know, be able to um, for example, for, for SMS uh, authentication, uh, bypass that in various ways, but it does add one extra hurdle um, for the attackers to cross. So that's another you know thing you know another technology that we, we definitely recommend for for all organizations to adopt for all their online systems and, and in particular email. So in this report, you also found that a significant number of attackers are only accessing email applications and not other cloud applications. Why do you guys think that is? So I think uh, kind of going back to what we were talking about with understanding like why attackers are compromising the account. Um, like email is kind of the primary way that an attacker can really gain leverage and gain information on an account, right? It's all in like one central location. So you have like the inbox, the contacts list, while kind of these other cloud applications an attacker would have to learn a little bit more about how to infiltrate those and, and kind of navigate their way around. So especially for attackers who want to quickly access accounts and quickly gain and extract value, um, email is kind of a prime target for that. Hey, I'd also just add to that. I mean, we saw some percentage of attackers access other applications, for example, SharePoint. Um, if I had to make just an off-the-cuff prediction, I, I think that over time we will see more attacks uh, targeting other applications. I mean, the Twitter um, compromise that we mentioned, um, at least based on reporting, seemed to have originated on in Slack, for example. So, you know, I, I really do think that in the future we will see more attacks coming through other systems. Um, yeah, I, th I think chat seems like that would be a pretty obvious place just because it's again a system that's you know become it's it's pretty ubiquitous and um and a lot of business oriented information is exchanged there right so that that seems to be uh another that would 
if I had to guess, that would be kind of a, you know, another prime target. But so, so just given the fact that we, at least to this point, email is predominantly the main vector, but that doesn't mean that in the future we won't see other, other vectors for attack. And that, I mean, that makes total sense. They'll go where they get, get the data, right? Yeah. Um, so we've talked about email being the main threat vector. We've talked about how often the attackers are in the accounts and, and what they do there. Um, are these attacks automated um, or is this a manual process that they go through? Yeah, so we, we, we saw signs of, of kind of both, but primarily we saw signs of manual, more manual work done on the part of the attackers. And, and kind of a few reasons why an attacker may, may want to like kind of manually infiltrate an account is one, there needs to be some level of like more sophistication for setting up kind of an automated system, right? And two, there also, you can, there can be a level of kind of this idea of like cheap labor, right? So you can hire someone who can cheaply kind of navigate their way through the account. Um, so that's why manual kind of manual, manual infiltra infiltration of these accounts still exists. But we, we did see some signs of like automation as well. Um, primarily from the point of like kind of sending these phishing emails. So we had an account, we would see like kind of an automated uh, phishing emails being sent to like, for example, like 50 recipients every single minute, for example. And, and, and this was clearly like some sort of automation done by like some sort of botnet or some sort of computer, right? So I think it, it kind of varies based on the attacker and kind of how much time they want to invest as well as like how much money they want to spend um, but for primarily, we, we did see mainly manual, manual ways to attack these accounts. Well, I'll just add a little uh, important point here. Uh, I mean, we, we've talked a lot about kind of sophisticated attacks, but, but, you know, still a lot of the attackers aren't sophisticated, right? So th there's a whole sure. spectrum, right? So, it, you know, at the, again, at the high end, you're seeing attackers that leverage these compromised accounts to do conversation hijacking and do these super contextualized kind of... Uh, um, attacks, but then on the low end, you know, it's probably some, um, you know, someone who's just probably read some kind of online blog on how to do this thing, and they just copy a template. Maybe that's, you know, someone posted on the dark web or or on some, you know, attacker forum, and they just copy paste it and they use it over and over again, right? So, um, yeah, so so you know, I'm not sure that like probably some good percentage of these attackers don't even have the uh, technical capabilities to automate the attacks, while some of them are, you know, are quite sophisticated. So there's just a whole, a whole spectrum. Now, in the research, you also pointed out that 93% of compromised accounts were actually not used to send phishing attacks. So why should organizations care if their account has been compromised? Yeah. So I mean, the, uh, again, um, reconnaissance is uh, is. is <laughs> worth a lot, right, in this world. So, I mean, that, that kind of demonstrates the value that these attackers are actually placing on reconnaissance and on patients. Um, so, um, you know, the fact that um, at least the, the, the study covered a particular time span um, of, of these accounts, you know, we started from, you know, time X to time Y, and we looked at, you know, different accounts and how they evolved during that time. But keep in mind, like, uninterrupted, uh, you know, uh, I guess our uh, we would guess that 100% of these uh, accounts would eventually have had uh, you know experienced a real attack from these compromised accounts. So, so you know these attackers are just biding their time and waiting for the right moment. So um, you know better catch you know better catch them before that right moment occurs rather than after you know your organization has you know accidentally wired you know a million pounds like in the case of these Premier League um, clubs, right? Um, so. Uh, better, you know, better catch it when you're infected, but before the harm was done. Um. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, we are unfortunately getting to the end of the show, which is a shame because I've really enjoyed this conversation. But, but, but before we let you go, one final question, one piece of advice or one final thought um, around the report or, you know, how can organizations keep themselves protected? Anything you want to end the show with? Yeah, I think. Oh, sorry. So go. Yeah. No, so I was just going to say, I, I really think this multi, you really want to think about this holistically, right? So, again, from 
intelligent, you know, maybe AI driven kind of email security and continuous uh, detection. I mean, so that's obviously very important, but you need to also think about your people, kind of the human firewall and, and make them aware of these attacks um, across, especially in departments that deal with financial transactions or healthcare data or, you know, sensitive departments. Um, and then finally, think about how are passwords and credentials managed. So this isn't, each one of these on its own is probably not good enough. You really want to have a holistic strategy for, for, for these types of attacks. I saw took the words out of my mouth, but I, mean, yeah. I knew. That's, <laughs> I, just read, I read your thoughts. That's why. <laughs> yeah, there, there, there's one system is not going to be perfect, right? So having kind of is, is kind of in security, this defense in depth kind of system where you have kind of the, the, the detector, but as well, you have security training for employees and, and kind of best practices. Is, is, it's kind of the best way to go. Security at every step, right? Indeed. Well, thank you, Neil. Thank you, Asaf, so much for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure, and we've learned so much. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Indeed. Thank you. Some really interesting insights, maybe even a bit of a reality check on you know, how you respond to emails, how you look after your passwords. Um, but this really brings it all to life. So if you want to delve, in, delve even deeper into the report, you can download the report at barracuda.com or register for the webinar, which is being held on the 12th of August. Details are in the comments below. Also, don't forget to follow Barracuda on LinkedIn to see our previous shows, as well as to find out what's coming up next on Below the Surface. Until next time, have a safe journey. Thank you.